All right, Tony, we're doing a little warm up here before before the full blown interview, but our audience is always just infatuated with what people are carrying their everyday everyday carry. So with all the stuff you've been through, with all the experiences you've had and 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 all the different outfits that you've worked, what are you packing every day? <laughs> Not just not just weapon, everything, medical, uh, anything you got. You know what, man? Uh, hey, and, and this isn't down on anybody that goes far beyond me, and you don't have to carry much to go far beyond what I carry. It, you know, situational dependent, right? I know that's a goofy blanket, blanket statement, but I'll tell you, I carry much different than when I'm with Melissa in a city than when I'm just like be bopping around, you know, our property in Harold's, North Carolina, right? Like the crime rate in Harold's, North Carolina is less than zero, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. Um, so around there, if I'm carrying, you know, most of the time I carry a, a, a Glock 43, 43X. That's what I have on me right now, um, which is kind of cool with the little 15 round mags from Shield and stuff. You know, now I got this little gun. It's got well, as many rounds as a 19. Um, and, and I want to be a little higher capacity when, when she's with me because, I mean, let's face it, enemy most likely course of action says that if you're trying to pick someone to mug, I'm probably not the profile. You know what I mean? Yeah. Diesel pickup. Uh, no, I don't have stickers on the back, but it's pretty obvious, you know, that I'm a country boy, you know, and I'm not a, a, not the biggest dude on the block, but I'm also not a little tiny guy. So I don't think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the typical target, right? Some heroin dude wants his freaking fix. Is he going to try and take 20 bucks from me? But the second she's with me, well, bad people know that now we're vulnerable. Yeah. Right? Because we have something that we care about. So yeah, I'll, I'll up to, you know, a Glock with a light on it or something like that. You know, if she's with me and we're going into the city, especially at dark or whatever. Um, you know, in my truck, there at any given time, there might be two carbines, four pistols, you know. I mean, I teach, so the yeah. truck's always got gear in it, you know, um, a bolt gun, et cetera. But yeah, as far as on me, um, sock P dagger, simple, you know, simple little knife. Um, Do you have that on you right now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, freaking, you know. The simple oh, nice. little sock pee dagger, man. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, Greg Thompson, uh, the sock pee guy, freaking came up with this. So Greg Thompson, you know, came up with the sock pee dagger and the whole sock pee program. It, it's a cool little dagger, man. Um, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of training, you know. So like Melissa has one. Uh, you know, it goes in your Molly, the Fit Riley and Molly. So it, it's just a great little piece of equipment. It's not very expensive. And like I said, it just doesn't take a whole lot of training. Just yeah. Poke, poke somebody a bunch of times and uh, hopefully deter them from whatever it was they set out to do in the beginning. Um, and then as far as like a knife goes, I actually carry, and, and I don't have it on me, um, <laughs> typically, I don't have it on me right now, the uh, the outdoor edge knives. Um, they're the ones that you can pull the whole blade out of. It's um, basically a razor blade. Oh, Okay. Uh, I've not seen these. Yeah, what is it called? They're they're made by Outdoor Edge. Outdoor Edge. Yeah. So I'll check that if out. like in hunters out there will, will recognize the Havilon blades, they're like the little Exacto blades knives. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, you clean an animal with them quick, and the razor blades. But they're those little tiny Exacto razor blades, so it's real easy to break one, and now it's now it's in your meat. You know what I mean? You lose a razor blade in an animal you're cleaning that you intend on eating. Well, now that you can't risk that cut, or you got to put a metal detector on it, or whatever. You know, so that's bad. But these outdoor edge knives—it's a three and a half inch blade, uh, and the whole blade is a razor blade. They cost like twenty eight dollars. A pack of ten blades is like six dollars. And some guys will say, "Well, you, why don't you sharpen knives?" Because I don't have time, man. You know what I mean? I, I get I was that. Taught to, you know what <laughs> Finally, I mean? I was, somebody yeah, that agrees with me. I, I'm like, I was taught to sharpen knives as a baby. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, I don't have time to sharpen a knife, dude. It takes me two seconds to swap this blade out. And a couple of people were like, well, you know, would you really be able to use that for self defense? And I was like, that's an excellent question because it's, you know. And so I stuck it through the height of a mule deer. And I was like, well, that's good enough for me. 
you know, and it is a razor blade, so slashing or whatever. But that's not what it's for. It's for cutting stuff, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tool. The little sock P dagger is for uh, self defense, and I carry that um, weak side, you know, gun side, sticky side. That way, if you know I am trying to fight for a gun, you know, um, I've had a couple of self defense situations where I wound up using my pistol, but in them I had to fight first. No you know? shit. Yeah. What? Where did uh, did that happen in service or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of a couple of cool instances. One one in a hotel room uh, up in northern Iraq where a meeting didn't go the way I wanted it to, and a uh, dude got pissed, pointed, put a gun in my, touched me with his pistol, sitting at a table in a hotel room. Shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, How many people were in there? How many? It was him and his bodyguard. And you and who? Just it's you. Me. Yeah. Shit, my dude. bud was downstairs, probably flirting with a pretty curd girl while he was sipping his coffee in the <laughs> lobby. You know, I'm upstairs <laughs> fighting for my life. You know, it's funny too because you know people always say just make space. I was on the sixth story, man. What am I gonna do? Jump out the window? Yeah. Um, but yeah, man. At my gun, I was you know when I rat, man. I was wearing a suit, and uh, my gun was in my computer bag, right at my feet. I mean, I could see it, and he's got this. It was insulting to be honest with you because it was a, uh, a, a Pakistani knockoff Beretta, and I'm like, dude, if you're gonna shoot me in the face, please use a nicer firearm. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling so so insulted right now. Um, so, in all seriousness, he put his gun up, and at that point, I was pretty. I was like, come on, man, that's not what how this should go. So I went for mine. Um, as I was bringing it up, he stood up and showed the little, it was like a little aluminum, like 1960s aluminum crappy table, you know, with yeah. crappy little furniture, you know. And uh, as he stood up, shoved the table into me, and I broke one round, and uh, it malfunctioned the gun, and it, the round hit him right here, but not from art or anything like that. So it changed his behavior a little bit, but not. Not really in a bad way. Like he was ready to fight at that point. Uh, it got serious real quick. And uh, his bodyguard, who was, it was a little hotel room, man. And his bodyguard's kind of, you know, leaned up against the uh, uh, the door there. And he's like, oh, <laughs> holy crap, <laughs> they're fighting, you know. And as he stood up, it basically, he wound up, I grabbed him and he stood up and we wound up on my back, table and furniture. I'm still in the chair. My head's up against the space heater. So I got burnt all at the back of my neck and back of my head. <laughs> it was, you know, crappy wall space heater or whatever. Not space heater, I guess a wall heater. And um, his bodyguard runs up, starts shooting. I could feel the overpressure and the heat. It was in my face. And the only reason he missed is because I had his boss by the head, trying to put that, his boss's head between me and his muzzle. And um, I'm whacking away. And it was like, Chunk, I felt that Glock go in the battery. I was like, hell yeah. Click. <laughs> Nothing in the chamber. And uh, I racked it right down his back and bodyguard him. Two shots. No shit. And so this is, you know, this is five years, six years into the war. So it's not my first fight. It's the first time I was behind the curve and truly fighting, you know, in a defensive way. Um, so I, it wasn't like, you know, I'd been on many targets before Yeah. and I wound up standing in a corner of that hotel trying to text my buddy, <laughs> you know, trying to catch my breath, not to poop myself, you know? And, uh, I was like, holy crap, I can't, I, I'm going to walk out of here. And then we had to clean up the mess and then the news story wasn't very good. Um, you know. Did you learn anything from that experience? Anything you would have done different? I think for quite a while after that, I didn't carry in the bag. <laughs> the, you know, my gun was on me. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was Northern Iraq. And, you know, as well as I do, in that time frame, we could walk around up there. You didn't even need a gun in Kurdistan, you know? Um, so instead of carrying on me, I carried it in my computer bag everywhere. Yeah. So I think after that, I carried on me um, a little more strictly, 
especially when I was dealing with, you know, some of those shadier assets and stuff. Damn, I, you know, <laughs> you always hear the saying, you don't need it until you need it. And uh, there it is right there, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You don't need it until you yeah. need it. Well, and, you know, and the whole fighting thing, I tell guys all the time, right? Like, and, and I, you know, I used to approach things like this. I would say, you know, this is my number one weapon. Of course, it's arguable how well it works. Uh, and then I got these. I got a knife and I got a gun. If I can't solve it with the first two, you know, right? I ought to be able to solve it with my brain and just leave. But like I said, in that case, and in another situation I had to defend myself, man, I had to fight first. You know, there was no just drawing your gun. There's no sub second, none of that, yeah. you know, sub second draws or any of that. Yeah, it wasn't gee, like bullshit. that, you know, no facing off, ready, go. It was, you know, a fist fight. So you know, when I'm talking to guys and girls, I'm like, man, you need to be able to strike with both hands and some type of get up off the ground, you know, at a minimum, be able to do that stuff. You know, maybe even learn a kick if you get time, but be able to throw hands, you know, at least a jab, because that's just one of the things when I'm working with, with folks in self-defense, I used to be left-handed, got hurt, had to switch to right-handed. So I'm kind of a switch hammer, I'm pretty ambidextrous, and uh, I'm probably very ambidextrous, so that would be an understatement. Um, I'm still mostly left-handed, right? It's genetic. But right-handed guys tend to have really weak hands, and if they haven't trained some type of jab or using a hand, they don't have a very effective left punch. Well, if you're going to draw while I'm like, if I start punching you in the face, are you going to be able to get to your pistol? Are you going to cover up? What are you going to do? Right? I'll start landing punches. punches. And, and I, not just me. Like, think about the average predator. Like, what type of dude would attack you? Right? Maybe crazy drug or whatever, but pretty confident dude. Right? So I imagine any dude that wants to square off with me and take my wallet is going to be a a pretty formidable fellow who can probably punch, yeah. you know? So that's a big thing with, with, when it comes to EDC is I'm like, hey, man, learn some basic strikes and how to get up off the ground, you know, some basic BJJ. Because I, guns, aren't, guns aren't the end all be all. And, you know, it's funny. I, I said, you know, this, these, that, and that. I actually added something to my EDC. I didn't even think about this. And not really my EDC. It's in my truck. But Melissa has it in her purse. Melissa carries a sock P dagger, um, and uh, she's got a shield plus now. She likes M and P's, and um, but now she also has a can of bear spray in her purse, and I have a can of bear spray in my truck. And we we were in we were in a movie theater. Some kids were misbehaving throwing change and stuff like that and just being kids. Well, I can't beat up 14-year-olds for being buttholes. You can't clearly, you know what I mean, even yeah. if you escalate it. But at the same time, and they were, they were, you know, 14 to 17, three or four of them. And let's face it, four 14 to 17-year-olds against one of us, one of them has a knife, well, you're losing. You yeah. might get pretty bad, badly effed up. And so I had to rethink it. I was like, well, you know, I, I can't beat these kids up, right? I can't shoot them. I can't stab them. They, like this, there's this gap in my EDC. And I was like, mace. And my buddy goes, how about bear spray? And I went, even better. I'm like, mace or pepper spray, cool. If bear spray is good for brown bears, it's got to be good for Shitheads. 14-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> Shithead 14-year-olds. Uh, they're going to learn a lesson. Yeah. And, and dude, so I had never messed with bear spray before. I carry a 44 Magnum in the back country for bears, right? Dude, this bear spray will spray like 40 feet, and it's foam. Like, it makes pepper spray look like daggone hairspray. Uh, so that's a, a thing I'm, I am carrying these days. And it's funny because, like, a good handful of my buddies are like, yeah, that's actually a good idea. You know what I mean? Like, if it's if it's a non-lethal engagement, you know, or something like that, to me that kind of bridges the gap between yeah. these and a knife. You know what I mean? And, and and that's a good thing because, like I said, we can't just can't just kill anyone. You know, you can't go lethal yeah. over arguments at the gas pump or stuff like that. And people are acting crazy these days. 
Uh, we see it all the time. You know? Oh, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Um, so, you know, if a young kid who's just being a punk, who's borderline, you know, I feel like bear spray teaches a lesson and no one has to go to jail and no one has to go to the hospital. Um, and hopefully that kid will learn a lesson and straighten out his ways. Yeah. You know? That's um, good. I'm going to, yeah. I think I'm going to incorporate that as well. You know, uh, and, you know, because especially face with it, the, a, a lot of criminals have been pepper sprayed. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah. when it came to Melissa, they're like, oh, no, bro. Bear spray is a whole different animal, right? It's concentrated, you know? So, you know, um, something to think about. You know, that's that's where I'm at in life. But, yeah, my, my ADC is not super crazy. My medical kit is in my truck. I don't carry a tourniquet on me. Um, and Lord knows the Internet might freak out for me saying this, but I wear a belt. And, you know, whoever my patient is, if I roll up on somebody that needs a tourniquet, I'm going to be able to improvise, whether I got to rip their seatbelt out. Um, I'm going to be able to make something. And, 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 you know, another thing I think a lot of people don't always think when they think tourniquets, they think stop the bleed. Well, there's also slow the bleed. Yeah, that's right? true. You know what I mean? If I can get it down to a trickle and get them to next level care, the hospital, a trauma center, and they lost half a pint of blood, they're fine. You yeah. know what I mean? So I don't carry a tourniquet on me. Yes, I have trauma kits in the truck, you know, um, but I don't carry it on me. Um, when I'm teaching, you know, yeah, there's one on my belt, but we're on a range. Uh, again, situational dependent. But yeah, pretty simple. Uh, yeah. I don't carry, you know, in my truck is a set of plates and, you know, one of my toolboxes in my truck or whatever, you know, there's, there's the, oh, I'm away from home. But I usually see it as more of a, Oh, look, a coyote, you know, that's really what the guns in my trucks are for is, you know, a coyote or, a, you know, something like that. But I don't live in the city anymore, man. And, and the threat level where I live is, you know, you would have to look for trouble, you know, you'd have to look for trouble where I live. More and more guys are moving out into the country, man. Yeah. That's what I'm noticing. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up country. You know, the, the county I live in right now in, in, uh, in North Carolina is very rural. But the county I grew up in, even more so. I mean, there are 12,000 people in the county I grew up in. There's one stoplight, and you don't really have – it's like for decoration. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, traffic's not that bad. Um, everybody knows each other. Everybody. And, you know, when you're a kid trying to misbehave, you know, everybody knows everybody is annoying. But when you're an adult, everybody knows everybody, that's a community. Right, we we throw that word around a lot. The soft community, the Second Amendment community. Well, I grew up in a community where everybody, everyone in town knew each other. We all had cookouts together. You know, the folks down the streets were our, my parents' best friends. The guys we hunted with, and now where I live in Harold's, I developed the exact same thing as as soon as I got there. Uh, made friends with the neighbor farmer. You know, and people are always, you know, like preparedness, you know, I guess kind of segue from, you know, EDC, like that whole preparedness. My neighbor is a farmer of uh, hogs, cattle, uh, grain, blueberries, blackberries, and they're starting raspberries next year. And they also grow like zucchini and squash. And, oh, wow. And they grow everything. Sad. So we have a cool, like, mutual relationship. Like if the world goes to hell, they're going to supply food <laughs> and I'll help supply the security, <laughs> you know? Um, what do you think more and more and more, especially the way we're seeing the world, you know, now everything in the, in the country as well, I mean, everything seems to be so fragile now, more and more people are looking at preparedness and how to, how to prepare. And, and a lot of these people have no idea how to get started. What would you say without getting too into the thick of things? What are, th let's just say top three things to start for somebody, for a, for a cubicle worker, nine to five guy that has no idea, doesn't own a firearm. I mean, we're talking greenest of the green. What would be your three recommendations to get started in the preparedness on a minimum budget? You know, right up front, it's it's none of the tactical stuff. 
You kind of think more on the, if you want to use a like more military term, I'm on the strategic level, network community. You know, what's that old saying? One is none. You know, I have a community and all of them have guns and all of them bring something to the table, right? Like my neighbors, they're farmers. And then, you know, I've made good friends with the gas company people. So they've got diesel and gas, you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons, right? So I think one of the biggest, you know, we hear guys talking about, you know, what's in your bug out bag? I'm like, I don't have one. Well, now at the same time, I do recognize that a lot of us had, you know, preparedness training. I know that I can go places and commandeer things. Right? I'm not worried about bug out vehicles because I see it like this. If you're trying to overland to somewhere more safe, because whatever reason you had to leave your home, um, and, and I don't see that happening, right? Like I don't, you know, unless unless the world went nuclear, I live close enough, I'm right between Lejeune and Fort Bragg. So, you know, the chances are if we go nuclear, I won't have to worry about much of anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't need a plan for that. <laughs> but, it, you know, for some reason I had to relocate. I, I hear guys talking about like overland vehicles and bug out bags and this kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, if I need to leave my house, I'm going to throw in my truck what I need to leave, right? It's probably not going to be like, oh, God, I got to go right now. I'm going to try to stay put because I have everything I need there to live and survive for weeks upon weeks. So it's kind of funny. You know, I see it. If I am going to take a vehicle, when it runs out of gas, I'm going to get a different one, you know, because if the world's gone that bad, fuels there are going to be fuel lines, right? Um, so that gets kind of weird because now you're talking about, you know, carjacking or stealing a vehicle. Now you're illegal. You know what? There's just, there's so many variables to this equation. You know, it's not, not simple to answer, but yeah, I guess to circle back to your, your, your question that, that cubicle city person, it's going to come down to network and community. Cause I mean, I hear guys talking about, well, we're going to head to the mountains. And I'm like, have you talked to the people that live in the mountains about that? <laughs> like, do you have friends there? Yeah. And they're like, well, no. I'm like, when was the last time you went camping and lived out of your bug out bag in the mountains in the wintertime yeah. or in the middle of July, right? Are, are you prepared for the insects? Are you prepared? Are you pre right? Yeah. And you, their eyes just keep like, there's all these parts of that equation they've never even considered because they're not outdoor people, you know? Um I'm pretty confident you can put me in the woods anywhere in North America. Well, probably anywhere in the world. And I'm going to be okay for a week. I'm going to find stuff to eat, you know, and I know how to hunt. You know, animals, you know, I can hunt with snares. I know how to build traps, all that stuff. Man, when I say I was a little white trash redneck kid growing up, yeah, man. I mean, there was times that, you know, for to put food on the table, we shot deer, you know. So learning to hunt. My dad was a, uh, you know, he grew up in the mountains of Western Virginia. His dad was a coal miner. And they put food on the table from hunting. Um, so I was lucky to have a lot of that handed down to me. Um, I mean, they were taking me coon hunting. Nice. When I was a baby. I couldn't keep up. Well, you couldn't hunt at nighttime, bro. You know? I had to learn to follow that dog to listen to the dogs barking and follow because I couldn't keep up with the guys, you know, but they were doing it on purpose. Now, at the time, I was just a young, you know, five-year-old, six-year-old kid trying to keep up with adults in the woods chasing these dogs that are chasing coons. And, um, but looking back, man, the lessons learned, A, you know, there are guys going through our special operations, like Canada DC schools, like SFAS, who've never spent a night in the woods. And now it's like, go land nav all night long. Well, for me, that wasn't a big deal, right? Like I spent nights in the woods as a little kid. So I was lucky there. But when it, when it comes to that kind of stuff, you know, I don't know that the average city slicker, how can they possibly learn all the things that country boys learn? They can't. They can't. They really can't growing up. But you can team up with one. Well, you know, you know there's, <laughs> another, there's another way to, if you don't mind, I'm going to interject you know, I don't know all of it either. I've, I've been watching your stuff on the gram, and, I mean, you're building your own house. I don't know how the hell to build a house. I don't know how to run electrical. But yeah. I will say this. You know, there there are a lot 
of there is a lot of good reading material on all of this stuff and it's not all tactics and shit i found this i found this book series it's called back to the basics and they teach you everything from gardening to building a house to trapping to fishing to everything and i i have a lot of those skills but when it comes to building and gardening i'm i'm weak yeah i I don't have time for it and when if that happens you know internet's going to be gone for sure you know and you have and you're not going to have a job Mm -hmm. you're not going to have anything to do but quickly read and learn what the fuck you need to learn Mm -hmm. to survive and so i would recommend getting a set of books you know maybe i'm maybe some medical stuff that yeah, back to the basics sure. uh, series that I was talking about, yeah. some hunting, how to clean it, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think it's so funny too, man, because none of the stuff, you know, like like framing my house or skinning an animal, right? I, I mean, it takes me forty minutes to quarter out, skin out an elk, you know, fifteen minutes on a deer. It's yeah. fast. Uh, of course, I've been doing it since I was a baby, but I can show you how to do it. And it's so simple. All of this stuff, you know, like, like we were talking about running bulldozers and stuff at, at breakfast this morning, right? I'm not afraid to try. My dad raised me like he made my dad was not a hugs and kisses type of dude, right? But he put food on the table, he worked a lot. His teaching methods were probably not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, you know, his style was, hey boy. You need to do this, this, and this before I get home. And I'd be like, Dad, I don't know how to do that or that. And I'm not sure about the third one, but I'll try it. And his answer was always, figure it out. Looking back, that was the lesson. Figure it out. Try. Just try. So I am so grateful to that dude to have raised me with the mindset that I can do anything. That I, can, I, mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. I get it. I'm not going to be an astronaut or the president of the United States. Um, hell, I can't even be a congressperson. Uh, <laughs> you know? Uh, but I'm just not afraid to try. You know, like I said, called up a place. I need a D6 bulldozer and a 325 excavator. You know? I'll figure out how to run it when it gets here. Yeah. You know? And, and I did. I mean, don't get me wrong. I had ran them when I was little, but you're talking about 30-year-old machines versus you getting a bulldozer now and it's got a computer screen. You're like, all right, I'm just pushing buttons till things started moving and next thing you know, I'm clearing land. Yeah. Um, do it yourself mindset, man. I mean, like you said, the internet will be gone, but in the meantime, everything, yeah, everything right there. humankind has ever come up with is right here. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't, I don't, I wish I could think of something that I can't YouTube, you know? The only thing I can come up with, and it always happens, uh, the only thing I didn't do in my career that I wanted to do um, was fly. I had a flight packet in um, and uh, thought I was going to go fly, and I fell and broke my back. And I thought my military career was over. So I ets went over to the agency, right? Um, so I never went back. I wished I had of, but when, so whenever the Black Hawk guys, the Chinooks or whoever, the pilots are, that are flying for us, I'm always like, can I fly it? And their answer, dude, is always the same thing. If you can figure out how to start it. <laughs> and I was like, let me get in the seat, <laughs> you know? And then when you get in, I start watching. You know, I'm like, what are these things? I'm gonna figure out how to start one of these things. And then I had a client come for long range and he's an Apache pilot. He basically gave me step by step instruction on how to start a Blackhawk. Nice. <laughs> so I'm nice. like, next time one of these dudes, I'm gonna get this thing fired up. They're gonna yeah. have to let me fly it, you know? No. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything we need to know is right there. You wanna learn to frame a house, man? Yeah. There are so many. For, you know, I, I tell like tactical guys, you wanna learn how to shoot better. How many videos are you gonna get on pistol grip if you Google it or YouTube search it? Try framing interior doors. And see what pops up. Yeah, you have a million different videos to watch, so it's it to me. It's not about like information available. It's about whether or not someone actually wants to learn stuff. Yeah, and like you said, I know when it comes to hunting and trapping that stuff, I'm pretty good to go. But like gardening, that is not my thing. Um, and books, we've started purchasing books because, like you said, if things do go bad, 
we're not going to have the internet. We won't yeah. have that YouTube. You'll still have the knowledge available. Right. So books. And um, I'm lucky because, you know, Melissa has started growing. We're at almost a company level of chickens now. Um, two donkeys, not that you would eat donkeys, but I guess you could if you got really hungry. Um, dogs, all that stuff. But, uh, you know, she's doing the gardening thing. She's composting the donkey's poo, uh, turning it into fertilizer for a garden and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, she's not a into the world type of person, but she's also a realist, a uh, very conservative, very able-bodied type person. Um, so she sees the writing on the wall as well. And a lot of people she, are coming to it. Yeah, but she also just enjoys it. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Uh, you know, my aunts, uh, you know, they, they were, you know, it was, it was quote unquote woman's work to keep the garden and to keep the lawn and the flowers planted, uh, to, to knit and crochet and all that. So Melissa's actually hanging out with my aunts, learning all that stuff, uh, and enjoying it. That's cool. You know, it's old school craft. It's making things with your hands, which I've always found very rewarding. I, I like building stuff. Yeah. It's funny because I hate tinkering, right? Like I hate tinkering on guns, right? Like little screws and stuff. And part of that's because I can't hold on to things very well anymore. It's just frustrating. Um, but like framing that house, every day I get down and look at it and be like, yeah, cool. That's cool. awesome. Cool. You know? So yeah, to, to that person who's looking, you got to start with the network. And city folk are horrible about it. You know, they don't know their neighbors. Uh, and their neighbors don't bring anything to the table either. So it's got to be that network. You know, you, you got to find people that know how to do the stuff that you'll need if everything goes to hell. I mean, and I think, you know, a likely scenario, and we've seen it around the country, you know, the the grid failures. Yeah. Man, it doesn't take but a couple of days of, uh, without electricity, and Americans are going to lose their minds. You know? Yeah. I just did an episode on that, and it was yeah, yeah. We're hanging on by a thread. Yeah, it's so old and outdated, and I mean, let's face it. Even like our inf our road infrastructure, you know, if whatever bad guy organization, China doesn't matter, terrorists, if they attacked ten bridges on the East Coast, and I don't mean blow them up, I mean like pull a tractor trailer full of gasoline on top of them, open the valve and set it on fire. Well, that, that bridge is finished, yeah. right? I mean, you're talking about chaos, you know? And couple that with, let's say, a hurricane when everyone's trying to leave Florida or leave North Carolina and or Georgia and all the interstates. So, I mean, you're talking about some pretty crazy happenings in places like Atlanta, Charlotte. You know, these cities will absolutely destroy themselves. Yeah. And the funny thing is, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons why America continues to survive and continues to be able to go down this path that we're on is we're so big. You know, Katrina hits in Louisiana and doesn't affect me one bit in North Carolina. Yeah. You know, raging wildfires in California doesn't really affect me in North Carolina. North Carolina floods. Sucks for all of us. You don't even know about it in, in Nashville. You know, um, our sheer size, I think, protects us in many ways, but it's also leading to our demise, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're so big that people won't organize. You know, if if we were half the size that we were in our government and these clowns that are, quote unquote, running our country, these so-called representatives, I don't think that's the right word. They don't even call themselves representatives. They call themselves Congress people, right? Because yeah. they know they don't represent us. Um, I think if we were closer together and what they were doing were affecting a, a, a more condensed or a, a densely populated America, Americans would have already been like, nope, y'all are done. You know, you're fired. I don't know. I don't know either, man. <sighs> That's a, it's like I have the answers, yeah. but I do not know how to rally the people in the U.S. to do the right thing. I, tr I mean, I try. It's just complacency. I think yeah, it all comes down to complacency and comfortability. Luxuries. We'll, we'll talk about that in your episode, but um, I did want to tell you, I got a friend over at SIG. He got really excited that you were coming. That's why I asked about your uh, EDC. And uh, so he wanted me to show you something. 
This is their, uh, this is their latest, I guess, EDC type weapon. And uh, I just wanted me to show it to you and get your thoughts on it. I can't even get in the box. Yeah, so. So is this their, what, their macro, right? Yeah, that's the yeah. Sig P365 macro. So there's a business card in there. I wanted me to give it to you. I think, I don't know what he's going to do, but, you know, I think he's. Uh, I did a, um, I did a review. And I'm not good at gear reviews. <laughs> Because I'm like, whatever, man, it's a gun. Does it make a loud noise when I press the trigger? Cool, yeah. it'll work. Because, I mean, go around the world, and sometimes I have to acquire guns where I go. And, like, heck, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, I was in Haiti, and my bud picked me up from the airport, and he had a, uh, an FN and a, uh, a Rossi five-shot 308. Not what? 308, excuse me, 38, not 308, 38 special. Nice. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? And he's like, it's all I got. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I guess that's that. what I'm using. Here I, we hope go. I, don't, I hope this FN works because this 38 Special is not what I want yeah. to be running around with. But um, but we did this uh, micro pistol review, and I had never shot one of these before. And one of the guys brought it out, one of my friends at Orsay Gun Store. And I was like, holy crap. This little gun shoots like a real full-size gun. Yeah. These little dudes are no joke. Um, really cool gun, man. I mean, they're not tiny, you know, it, it, but the fact that they're thin makes them so daggone. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason why this gun's so popular, man. Yeah. It's like just the right size, you know? You know, when um, they, I mean, this is, they've done a couple versions of the 365. What I really yeah. What I really like about how they designed it, I don't know if you know this, but they just they actually designed the magazine first for the 365 I did not because know they that. wanted remember the original one I think held 12 rounds plus one right okay and so they developed they designed the magazine first and then designed the gun around the magazine and that was the first I may be wrong I don't think I am but I believe that the 365 was the first double stack. What do they call it? Subcompact, yeah, you know, pistol. Micro, I don't know. And um, <laughs> all these labels. Yeah. Well, they really revolutionized, you know, the yeah. subcompact market. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it now, right? Like, well, of course, Glock's always behind the times. And, you know, Shield brought out their magazines for the Glock. And because they made them out of metal, there's room for more bullets in them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because I still am in 20th group and still work for the government sometimes. Uh, I just got to stay on the Glock, you know? Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll shoot my 2011s, you know? They're, they're a lot of fun, but I always maintain my proficient, proficiency with the Glock. Um, everyone around me is shooting SIG. Really? Everyone around me is shooting SIG. Uh, Dustin, my buddy that, that helps me teach uh, the 320 series. Um, we've got a female that uh, we just brought on to help teach some of the um, – the female type stuff, uh, and, and not just female stuff, because she's amazing. She's a great shooter, great instructor. Sigs, and they both, this is what they carry. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Well, call yeah. Jason up, and uh, maybe he can hook you up with one of those. Hell yeah. Jason? Yeah. Jason, uh, Business card's right okay. in there. Cool. First contact info. Nice. But. Yeah, man, Sig. They have, I mean, who would have thought 10 years ago, because you guys had what 226s, right? Y'all had the SIGs. Yeah. And you know, we were running what Berettas or whatever. And who would have thought back then that SIG was going to be like the number one contractor, I know, right? you know? They amazing. Yeah. You know? Well, amazing. let's get into your episode. Hell yeah. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.